women in the house who are mothers, happy Mother's Day. Uh, and we will run this agenda to time because I want to get home and get pampered by my family. <laughs> um, so it's, this is actually a really uh, important conference and it's an honour for me to uh, chair this conference. It's on a very important topic and today uh, the agenda of course is around Trident and Arms Conversion. Um, and it's also a conference in memory of a very important person, the late Dr. Alan McKinnon. Uh, he's, he left a very important legacy to us in terms of his contribution to the peace movement in Scotland. And uh, I certainly uh, remember being on many platforms, many marches, many demos, but I think probably one of the most seminal uh, pieces of work uh, was contributed was the work that he did with STUC uh, around the economic and the employment benefits that actually could come out of Trident conversion. And, you know, I think that's a really important uh, thought that we should take with us into this conference today and into the questions that we're asking. Because when you're talking about something that could cause mass destruction uh, and also costs £160 billion pounds to renew, then it's not just a, co you know, a conference about peace and about arms. It's actually a conference about austerity. It's a conference about political choices uh, that we have before us and that our governments and the people in power uh, have to make. And you know, when you think about £160 billion and the good that that could do in our society, uh, that, you know, the alternatives are vast. Uh, we could make different choices. We could choose to invest that money in a different way. And, you know, there is no question that we could certainly retain every single job that is currently involved in Trident at the moment and protect every single job that's currently involved, but use that collective brain power to good use. Uh, and, you know, I don't believe it's beyond uh, the imagination of people to be able to do that and to do that well. Uh, it is merely a question of political will and are people brave enough to make the right choices and choose to go down a different path. Uh, you know, we could protect every single job, put it to fantastic use and also have plenty of change to spare. We could invest in building houses, we could invest in our public services, we could invest in paying the lowest paid people in our society a decent living wage that they would go on and spend in their communities. Uh, and you know, on and on and on, pensions for people, earlier retirement for people, getting more jobs for our young people, retraining people, the list is endless. And I think that's what it's about. It's about harnessing the positives here and thinking about the alternatives. Uh, so that's you know, something that I, I hope we will catch on to because it's certainly something that Alan always articulated absolutely brilliantly. Um, and, you know, it's not just timeless to have this conference to remember Alan, but timeless because 2016 is the year, you know, that we all know the decision on renewal is being made. Uh, and today I think we have a great deal of experience coming to the platform in this room from across Scottish politics. Uh, unfortunately, we do have apologies from Andrew Murray, which is a, is a great shame, but he was unable to make it today. But we do have a fantastic uh, keynote speaker in Kate Hudson, who's the General Secretary of CND, um, and she's certainly been a leading figure in the campaign for Trident cancellation. Uh, and we also have a range of other people coming today. We've got John Ainsley uh, from Scottish CND, Denise Christie, uh, from Campaign for Socialism, Neil Finlay, MSP. Uh, we have uh, Bill Kitt, MSP, who's sitting here. <laughs> uh, we also have Leslie Brennan, MSP, who's a late addition to the agenda, but very, very welcome. Um, we have Dave Moxham, the Deputy General Secretary of the Scottish TUC, Chris Stevens, the MP for Glasgow South West, uh, and Arthur West, Chair of Scottish CND. And if I've missed anybody else out who's involved, then I do apologise, but I'll obviously be introducing you later. So I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Uh, I'm just going to go on and introduce 
Kate Hudson uh, to take the floor. Thanks very much. Thanks very much indeed, Ros, and thanks for inviting me to speak here today. I consider it an honour uh, for me to be able to speak at this conference in memory of Dr. Alan McKinnon. He was a great friend personally, but also a great friend to CND and, of course, to the wider peace movement. And his loss is a great loss for all of us. Um, the, the, Two particular works um, which Alan wrote, which have been very important to me and to my understanding and the understanding of C&D more widely um, as to what's actually going on in the world. And I know that other colleagues will be talking about um, Alan's work on Trident and defence diversification. So I wanted to uh, talk about some of the themes that Alan addressed in two of his uh, very important works. Um, because they both um, touch on uh, fundamental dynamics of imperialism today. So I think that they help us to understand uh, the underpinning uh, of what we're dealing with. The first um, is his work on the US pivot to Asia, Falling Eagle, Rising Dragon. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with that. And the other is his extensive work on NATO expansion, not only in terms of territorial expansion, but NATO's strategic expansion um, over the last 25 or so years. And these two works, I think, come into particular focus for us at the moment um, as we head towards two very significant events this year. Firstly, of course, the US presidential elections uh, later on, and of course also the forthcoming NATO summit, the Heads of NATO summit, which is taking place in Warsaw in July. So we're expecting to see quite important things taking place there. And I think in touching on both of those themes, um, I want to draw out some elements of what I see as imperial overstretch by the United States and what that means in terms of challenges to us around the questions of war and peace. So first touching on the US presidential elections and the, the wider framework there, um, Trump of course is uh, a cause for some concern. In a recent Stop Trident public meeting, which there have been many recently, someone even suggested, and I think they were only half joking, that we needed to keep Trident to deter the United States <laughs> under President Trump. You know, so um, it, it's an alarming prospect. Uh, interestingly, I was on the way up here on the train yesterday, I was reading the New Statesman. In there, somebody said, we shouldn't worry about Trump. The US political system was designed to stop anybody doing anything much, <laughs> particularly the president. <laughs> um, and he referred to the fact that Barack Obama uh, can't control the sale of guns or close Guantanamo Bay. So uh, there's obviously some truth in that. And so we have relief uh, with regard to a future President Trump. But of course what it means is that the juggernaut of US imperialism goes on irrespective of who is um, elected to the White House. Now, in his um, work on Falling Eagle, Rising Dragon, Alan quoted Hillary Clinton in the opening paragraph. And of course, she's a, a potential, or perhaps very likely, to be the next presidential candidate. And he quoted her as saying, the 21st century will be America's Pacific century. And of course, we are aware of the US pivot to Asia it was very strongly trumpeted just a few years ago, and it represented a significant shift under Obama's presidency um, in US foreign policy. And it was based on a recognition that Asia had become the key engine of the global economy and the driver of much of its politics. So in a sense, it was inevitable that the US would do that kind of reorientation and so at that time its intention was to reorientate towards the Pacific and towards Asia and away from uh, the Middle East. Um, of course by orientation it's understood that that means um, US containment of China because 
China is clearly and remains uh, in spite of some slight slowdown in its economy, and when you say slowdown, let's remember we still mean massive economic growth. Uh, in spite of the slight uh, change there, China remains the US's biggest global challenge. So Obama's strategy has been to make the Asia-Pacific region the central focus both for its military strategy and for its economic strategy as well. And its intention has been to put the US at the centre of two huge economic blocks. So no longer being satisfied with a kind of um, Atlantic, kind of um, Europe, US block, to also now have a trans-Pacific block. And through these two blocks to give the US global leadership in the 21st century. And one example of this um, is the Trans-Pacific Partnership Initiative. Um, and Alan uh, looked in his work quite closely at this, even though at that point when he was writing, it was still in its um, sort of development phase. So he was um, had quite a lot of foresight there. It was eventually signed in October last year. And it, it links through a trade agreement, the US and 11 <coughs> Pacific Rim countries. And it's so significant that it's led a number of commentators to say that it heralds the start of a new great game, um, pitting the US <coughs> against China. And I think even though um, we see issues around Russia and those kinds of relationships, which I'll come on to in a bit, have kind of perhaps taken the kind of centre stage in terms of media coverage and political rhetoric and so on. Um, that dynamic between the US and China remains absolutely fundamental. Um, and it's well known, I think, that um, in terms of US Defence Department military simulations and things which they do, the simulations are always about or eventually come down to war between the US and China. So we need to keep very focused um, on this terrible possibility. <coughs> Now, of course, China has taken its own initiatives to balance the US challenge. Um, you may have heard recently about the establishment of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, for example, you know, challenging the US in, in a financial way. And this has put something of a break on US ambitions. Um, and currently, some observers say, well, there's a bit of a kind of, a bit of a standoff at the moment, kind of a bit of a break um, on development of uh, kind of um, progress of the Asia pivot at the moment. Um, alongside the trade alliances, of course, um, the United States has also sought military alliances, um, often uh, developed via NATO's regional structures and regional partners. and. Um, colleague here just now passed me um, a report from an, an Australian newspaper about uh, how the US is drawing Australia into its operations um, in uh, the uh, East Asian, re Asian region and so on. So it's been a pattern over the past few years. Rather than the US doing things directly, that it draws in through bilateral or multilateral <coughs> partnerships other countries into its global project. Um, and in fact, one of the features of Obama's approach has been uh, what it calls working in alliance with others. Um, he refers to it as a new multilateralism, and of course they do always try and make things sound nice, because working in alliance and new multilateralism sounds like a positive thing. Um, Alan McKinnon described it as trying to do more with less in a rapidly changing world. <laughs> so I think that's, that's very um, accurate. Um, because through its kind of orientation to China, but also um, it's, uh, although it's wanted to vacate the Middle East, you know, and get out of that situation, that hasn't been possible. It's got re-involved in the Middle East situation <laughs> and then re-involved with stuff around Russia. The United States is, is um, in a situation where it's weakened by the economic crisis of 2008 and not yet recovered. It found, finds itself in this situation of having, as it sees it, to deal with a lot of issues and one of the ways in which it's done that is to try and get its allies to do more. Um, so, of course, we see that 
um, very clearly with uh, NATO in Europe. Um, the United States has tried to get its allies in Europe to foot the bill for what is essentially US military domination in Europe and beyond. So that's the kind of tactics of the US elite at the moment. The US is stretched by the financial crisis and its failed foreign policies, it still wants to get out there and get more and bring, it and bring the world under US domination, but it can't really afford to do that in its normal methods. Um, NATO is actually um, going through some uh, interesting developments itself at the moment and facing kind of, uh, sort of differing uh, priorities within its uh, members. So, um, and this is really coming to a head as we approach the Warsaw summit this July. Now, as we're all uh, very much aware for the last 25 years there has been this territorial and strategic expansion of NATO. Um, since the 2010 strategic concept of the NATO summit in that year, NATO has had three core commitments. Um, firstly, uh, collective defence, which is how they describe the kind of original role of NATO, you know, to defend each NATO country will defend all the others, so that kind of defensive thing or traditional role. Uh, secondly, what they call cooperative security, which is actually global reach of the United States through military partnerships under NATO's control, <coughs> so it's that sort of thing. And then third is uh, crisis management, uh, which is how they describe out-of-area military operations, so things like um, Afghanistan, for example, they call that crisis management. Um, all of this, of course, is underpinned by uh, first use nuclear policy to which Trident nuclear weapons are of course assigned. So that's the kind of, the sort of uh, three pillars of um, NATO's strategy currently. And then you may remember, and some of you may actually have been to Newport in South Wales in 2014, uh, that was the NATO summit there in the autumn of 2014, um, where they first began to address um, the situation with Russia and the Ukraine. So what was NATO going to do about that? Um, and from that uh, NATO summit in Newport um, came two things in particular. Um, one was that NATO uh, would have a rapid reaction force for Eastern Europe and the Balkans, so kind of that area which perceives itself to be threatened by Russia. Um, and then it also agreed to a 2% uh, G of GDP spending level for all European members of NATO that they had to pay into the military pot. And obviously that's been the subject of debate here in Britain. Um, interestingly, only the US, UK and Greece actually fulfil this 2% of GDP spending. Um, but both of these issues are going to come back up again at the Warsaw summit because the Polish president, um, as you may know, the new pre recently elected president Andrzej Duda, who's um, well quite right wing president, um, he, he is really arguing very, very strongly for a greater, greater NATO presence in Eastern Europe and he is the person who is leading the demand for permanent NATO combat units in Eastern Europe and the Baltic region and also permanent NATO bases. You know, he wants permanent bases in Poland but elsewhere in Eastern Europe. <coughs> and he's putting forward what he calls the Warsaw Initiative on Strategic Adaptation. In other words, uh, he wants an, a reorientation away from the global role for NATO and a reorientation as some people call it, back to basics, that it has to come back to NATO defending its member states and particularly defending its member states in Eastern Europe against Russia. And this would include increased conventional weaponry, including heavy armour. And I noticed actually um, in the government's strategic defence review in the autumn, there was a little element where they said, uh, they talked about the importance of increased conventional deterrence against Russia. You know, so I guess that's referring to this kind of 
uh, NATO orientation. So we will be required, if this, if this goes through, we will be required to uh, cough up more money uh, for increased conventional weaponry for Eastern Europe. Um, so um, that's one of the key issues that will come up. But also, as most countries don't cough up their 2%, where is the money for that going to come from? You know, it's kind of a dilemma within NATO. But there are other key problems for them uh, within this process. So the, the Polish president is campaigning very actively for that. But other, other NATO countries don't see Russia as an immediate threat and they don't want to go down this road of heavy armour in Eastern Europe and bases because they think it will provoke Russia, which I think is actually a pretty sensible assessment of it. And interestingly, Germany has previously blocked efforts to place <coughs> NATO troops in Eastern Europe on a permanent basis because it risks straining relations with Russia. And Germany has tended to want to have good relations with Russia. So that's an interesting uh, development. And then secondly, um, how likely is the US to renounce its global role to put loads of kit into Eastern Europe? Um, I don't think that that's very likely, because that would jeopardise the whole pivot to Asia orientation, um, as well as its economic and military alliances elsewhere. So that, that tension is something that exists. And of course, the third factor is that although the United States wanted to orientate away from the Middle East, those issues still exist in what they describe as NATO's southern neighbourhood. <laughs> so uh, Iraq, Syria, Libya and so on. So those continue. Um, so in spite of Poland's drive towards uh, NATO militarisation in Eastern Europe, um, U.S. interests are against an, against an increasing hostility with Russia. So that is something that we need to uh, look at. And I think that that, um, that kind of tendency is underlined by the recent announcement, uh, three days ago I think it was, by the uh, EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker, who announced that Ukraine will definitely not be able to become an EU or NATO member for 20 to 25 years. You know, so that's quite a, a significant uh, shift, um, perhaps a setback for what um, some of the kind of imperialist aspirations have been for Ukraine, but um, perhaps a positive development uh, in terms of relations with Russia. So, um, to move towards concluding, Ros, as we head towards the summit in Warsaw, we see some differing priorities within the imperialist camp, and divisions within imperialism are always an opportunity um, to uh, campaign and to analyse and to kind of bring about perhaps a different perspective. Um, but the fact is, and this is something that Alan always made very clear, it's very clear in his writings, that NATO is the military wing of a much wider project to implement US policy around the world and ultimately to open the world to business for US companies. So although we can get lots of political rhetoric and you know high sounding um, posturing about freedom and democracy and all that sort of thing, at the end of the day, um, that's what it comes down to. It comes down to the US business interests and I very much agree with Alan's analysis of that. So that's what will drive NATO policy. Um, and it's vital that when NATO heads meet in Warsaw in July, that the voice of the peace and anti-war war movements are uh, very strongly heard. And I think we need to oppose both the ratcheting up of tension with Russia and also <coughs> oppose the increasing global role of the United States through NATO. So I think those are our, our twin priorities. Um, just to say a word about how the peace movement is organising for the Warsaw Summit. I'm sure many of you will be aware that over every single summit, you know, for a decade or so, we've held counter-conferences and demonstrations in 
those countries working through the international no to NATO network and we'll be doing the same again in Warsaw. Uh, CND and Stop the War are both involved and will both be mobilising so I very much hope in different ways people will be able to support that initiative and I'm sure the Morning Star as well will be uh, promoting and, and publicising these uh, important political developments. And of course as Roz said at the start, you know, this is about political choices, you know, and I think we have to make uh, our voice, which is choosing peace, uh, really very strongly heard. Thank you.